it's recording, right? All right, um, so I'll be talking on the cons of uh, using albumin shock, and then of course Jackie's going to follow me and talk about the miraculous benefits of albumin. So uh, this is our CME question of the day. Um, what movie is this scene from? Um, Precisely. So on this scene, you can actually see these medics using uh, packets of albumin and sulfa on injured soldiers. Apparently, it stops bleeding. So I cannot attest to the scientific authenticity of this, but I have a feeling we kind of use albumin in a similar fashion. So disclosures, none. But I think I should say that I have received crystalloids for hemodynamic support at least three times in my life. So the objectives of my talk today is to review and analyze past and current literature on the use of albumin and shock, and then discuss potential concerns with use of albumin. So interestingly, um, albumin goes back before the 1900. It was actually the first uh, human uh, protein that was isolated from plasma for um, clinical application. But it wasn't until 1941 when a young 30-year-old uh, guy with polytrauma with, and pneumothorax with hypotension was successfully resuscitated with about 20, 50 grams of albumin. Um, and the response in that original article was that the patient responded with normal hemodynamics following that. And then shortly after that, on December 8, uh, 1941, Pearl Harbor, when Harvard Medical School, uh, Harvard Medical School shipped about uh, 29 vials of albumin to treat uh, seven severely in burnt uh, sailors. And all of them reportedly had successful outcome. But then it was until three, and then in between 1941 to 1943, about 30,000 30, vials of albumin were produced on a monthly basis. So that's how much albumin was being used. And then in 1943, we had our very first clinical trial and about 200 healthy volunteers and patients in shock were treated successfully. At least they were shown to tolerate it and it was actually um, had some efficacy, at least based back on the data back then. But then for 30 years, they were really, it wasn't truly validated in a clinical setting. The first randomized clinical trial with the use of albumin was in 1975, when 17 uh, surgical patients received albumin versus some form of crystalloid. And then the end point to that study was essentially that there was uh, less extracellular uh, fluid expansion with the use of albumin. And the majority of um, randomized trials that we have are between 1975 till 2004, actually. But then there were some safety concerns, and that was highlighted by this infamous Cochrane review that we're probably all aware of. And this led to an FDA safety alert, and which is why always we think is albumin the right thing to use. So let's look a little bit more closely what this Cochrane review told us. This was published in 1998 in BM, uh, British Medical Journal. The authors wanted to look at all-cause mortality, as, which was their primary endpoint. They gathered about 34 randomized control trials, which eventually only about 30 met their inclusion criteria. So about 1,200 patients uh, were eventually included in their final analysis. And um, the studies mostly had the endpoint, the, the interventions that the authors looked for in these studies were either albumin or purified uh, plasma fraction versus some form of crystalloids or no crystalloids in the control arm. And patients were grouped into one of three groups, either surgical, uh, burn patients, or those with hypovolemia. What did the results of this Cochrane review tell us? That raised all the, um, the red flags. So this is a little busy, but the point that uh, the eventual pooled analysis of all these three subsets of patients in this Cochrane review told us the following. There was in, the relative risk of death was actually 1.68 when albumin was used. And um, the confidence interval was between, uh, the 95% confidence interval was between, uh, was 1.26 to 2.23. Now in the specific pi patient population of hypovolemic patients, the relative risk was 1.46. The authors concluded that in the pooled analysis of all these three groups, um, use of albumin increased mortality by 6%. And then, so for every 17 patients that received albumin, there was approximately one death, is what the authors concluded. But this meta-analysis was not without fault. I'm sure Jackie is going to rip me apart, so I might as well just say it now. It, um, they used the patient population, the studies included malaria patients, patients, newborn patients, 
Some of the studies were burn patients and the others were shock. So it was a very heterogeneous group of patients that were tested. And then the type of albumin used also varied from study to study. So we're not necessarily con comparing the same control arm or the intervention arm. And in addition, um, majority of the trials that were included in this um, review um, had about less than 30, per, 30 patients per trial. So it had a lot of fault. But then um, following 1998 up until 2001, there was a few other uh, meta-analysis, um, particularly one by uh, FERC and the other one was by Weix, I believe. And fortunately, neither one of these studies actually demonstrated um, similar mortality concern. But without dissecting those meta-analyses, let's look at more robust data that we have. Um, prob probably the, the best randomized control trial that we have after that 1998 <clears throat> Cochrane review was this um, SAFE study, which was published in New England Journal of Medicine in 2004. So this was an Australia slash New Zealand study, multicenter, randomized, and double-blinded. So any patients in an ICU setting that were thought to require fluid resuscitation, were randomized to receive either 4% albumin or normal saline. So about 7,000 patients were enrolled and they were randomized in a one-to-one -one blinded fashion with the primary outcome of death from any cause within 28 days. The secondary outcome was survival time, uh, vent days, length of stay, organ dysfunction, and uh, requirement of renal replacement therapy. So this is the Kaplan-Meier um, probability of survival curve. Y-axis is the probability of survival. and the X-axis, you have the days uh, reflecting the primary endpoint of 28-day mortality. As we can see, albumin or saline, there was no differences in mortality. They both, both survival lines approximate each other. Uh, and when we look closely at the other primary and secondary endpoint, there was no differences in length of stay, whether it be ICU stay or hospital stay ventilator days or renal replacement therapy. So meaning albumin or saline didn't, didn't uh, change mortality. But predefined subgroup analysis of trauma patient here, we could see that the relative risk of death was actually 1.36 when, uh, when they received albumin versus um, saline, meaning saline patients did better. Uh, while albumin patients, patients who were, trauma patients who received albumin fared worse. When the authors looked in closer, it was the majority of this data was driven by by patients who had head injury. So mortality was about 24 and a half percent when uh, they received albumin versus 15. But in patients who did not have any head injury, the mortality was pretty much similar in both interventions. There was some concerns that perhaps the 28-day mortality was not necessarily a good endpoint in trauma patients with traumatic brain injury. So the authors looked, uh, followed through these um, patients for, for about two years to see if this mortality benefit actually held true in the long term. Um, and this was published in a postdoc analysis by the same group of investigators. And we, on, on the left-hand side, you can see the two-year um, Kaplan-Meier survival curve, the difference maintains for approximately two years um, for saline versus albumin. So meaning perhaps patients with traumatic brain injury uh, do worse with albumin. Now, there are a lot of theories as to why this may be the case, but at least from the study, we do know that patients who received albumin actually ended up having a higher intracranial pressure. So perhaps this has a role for, path this has a pathogenic role. And the other thought is albumin, at least the way it was used in this study, is hypotonic as well as hypo-oncotic. Um, both of this has been postulated to um, enhance the um, uh, vasogenic as well as cytotoxic injuries that traumatic brain injury patients have and potentiate um, or potentiate their mortality. Another thing that we noticed from, uh, or another red, flag, I guess, from this study is patients who received um, albumin had a higher, had more blood transfusions, so particularly on the first two days of um, enrollment. So, and as we could see, 
the albumin group, the amount of packed red blood cell transfusion was about 98 ml compared to 71. And then this difference was further enhanced on day two. Um, they were both statistically significant. The, why this may be the case? Well, one albumin was thought to perhaps maybe be of a more dilution, have a more dilutionary effect on the serum than saline. And albumin is also has other hemostatic, um, alters hemostatic mechanism, also um, alters hemostasis, which I'll be going into a little bit later. So in conclusion from the study, there was no differences in mortality. Um, it, albumin infusion did not result in changes in length of stay, ventilator days, or renal replacement. But if you have traumatic brain injury, you have to be cautious. And in addition, it increases perhaps your transfusion requirement. So following the initial SAFE study, there were a couple of meta-analyses that were done again that relied heavily on SAFE. And one of the other subset analysis that Jackie will probably talk about is there was a trend towards a mortality benefit in shock patients in SAFE. Now, this was validated with, by a few other meta-analyses that heavily, entirely relied on the SAFE data. So to look closer into this, um, there was an Italian study called Albius, published in 2014, based, um, which tried to um, elucidate this closer. So this was a multicenter trial. This was open label, and it enrolled patients with severe sepsis in about 100 ICU settings in Italy. Patients were randomized uh, to receive either albumin plus crystalloids or crystalloids alone. Um, to ensure that they met hemodynamic parameters per early goal-directed therapy. And following day one, patients who were randomized to receive albumin uh, were received further PRN albumin dosing to ensure that their serum albumin stayed greater than 30, 30 um, grams per liter, uh, according to this protocol over here. The primary outcome was death at 28 days. Uh, secondary outcome was death at 90 days, organ dysfunction, um, degree of organ dysfunction and length of stay. So I summarized some of the key findings of these endpoints. The primary outcome, there was no difference, meaning albumin infusion did not result in any changes in mortality. Neither did it make any difference to the 90-day mortality, which was their main secondary outcome. Um, and then of all their other secondary outcomes, the things that I wanted to highlight was there was uh, albumin infusion did result in worse subscore, the, sub, the coagulation subscore of the SOFA was worse in albumin infusion, so was the liver score. Um, the reason the coagulation score was worse was because albumin does cause platelet dysfunction and it also alters hemostasis. Um, and then the liver, disf liver score was worse perhaps because of the bilirubin content of albumin solutions. But other than that, there was no difference in renal replacement therapy or any of the other endpoints. But the authors did carry out a postdoc analysis um, of septic shock patients among these patients that were enrolled. And according to them, when they looked at their when they looked at the 90-day um, mortality, patients in shock when they received the albumin, there was a trend towards benefit. Um, as depicted in this forest curve. But if you look at the confidence interval, it's 0.77 to 0.99. That's like 0.01 away from one. It is statistical, <laughs> but, but, so this was an unadjusted um, post-hoc analysis. But when they adjusted it uh, for clinically relevant variables, which the details of which we don't know according for at least from the original article, the statistical significance was actually lost. The relative risk was 0.88, the confidence interval was 0.77 to 1.01. So now I could say it's just barely <laughs> above one. So, but my question is, um, first of all, the, this was not a predefined population and it was a postdoc analysis. So you always have to look at postdoc analysis with a skepticism. And then of course I mentioned the difference of 0.01. And then the other thing is, the primary endpoint was the 28-day mortality. The, high, the, mm -hmm. the, um, the point that the authors were trying to make was the 90-day mortality, which was a secondary endpoint. 
So why not do a postdoc analysis of 28 day mortality? Why do it on a secondary analysis of a 90 day mortality? Actually, when I looked in further, there was an abstract that was published by the authors that looked into the 28 day mortality. And that did not suggest the same benefit that albumin yielded when 90 day mortality was applied to it. So to me, why would albumin result in a 90 day improvement in mortality, but it doesn't result in a 28 day improvement in mortality? I don't know and I don't think anybody knows either. So proponents of using albumin for shock rely heavily on this and a lot of the meta-analysis that come after this are based entirely mostly from this data and to me, I'm not convinced based on this. So in conclusion, at least from the Albions, so Jackie I'm sure is going to go about all the hemodynamic improvements that you're going to see with albumin. Um, it's safe, sure, but it doesn't improve any outcome in shock and it does not improve survival. There were a few other randomized trials that followed um, or just that preceded Albius but did not we're not necessarily the best trials, but I think it's relevant to review those. One was the CRYSTAL trial. This was published in JAMA. Although this was a crystalloid versus colloid trial, subset analysis of uh, the trial, we can look at the albumin versus the crystalloid uh, data set. And of course, there's a huge discrepancy between the crystalloid arm versus the albumin arm, but essentially there was no mortality benefit on 28 days, 98 day benefits, even in sepsis patients. Um, for albumin versus crystalloids as depicted here. All the real hazard ratios are above across one, essentially, in all of these endpoints. Similarly, um, this was actually probably the next, probably one of the best randomized control trials that there is, along with Albius, uh, that looked at um, albumin in septic shock, shock patients. But unfortunately, this has not been published. The data for this is only in an abstract format. I'm not quite sure why the authors have not published this in a journal yet. But <clears throat> this is a French study conducted in about 29 ICUs. And um, the intervention arm was 20% albumin infusion. The control arm was uh, normal saline. And the patient population included were septic shock. Now, the primary endpoint was a 28-day mortality. There was no differences, as we could see in this kaplan meier survival curve, between both the albumin group versus the control group. The secondary endpoint was 90-day mortality, SOFA evolution, catecholamine in three days, infections, and length of stay. Of all the secondary endpoint, I don't have the data, unfortunately, with me because this, these are unpublished data, and it's only in an abstract format. Only the catecholamine in three days was found to be beneficial with albumin, but any all of the other secondary endpoint did not have any statistical significant uh, benefit with albumin. So Cochrane also had other and updated the review following the heels of the Albius, and at least the safety concern was uh, not there anymore. And then there were a multitude of other uh, meta-analyses that came after Albius. They relied heavily on Albius and Crystal, but the majority of the studies did not show any benefit of using albumin in shock patients. Um, even the one or two trials that did, such as the one by um, Zhu et al., uh, relied mostly on the Albius data. So at least it's safe, but is use of albumin worth it? How much does albumin cost at face value? Normal saline costs about one and a half, one and a quarter dollar per liter. Albumin about a dollar per gram. So when you translate this into clinical practice, so at Henry Ford, we use, if we look at any patient that's on albumin, most of them are in a standard dose of 25 Q6, which is not necessarily what any of the trials that have evaluated have used. That costs about $100 per day just per patient. And then if we already do a single infusion according to the SAFE protocol, that's about $70. Um, a single infusion per albius would cost us about $120. So clearly we see the difference between normal saline and albumin. So in, we don't have, it, I don't see a cost justification. I don't see um, mortality justification of using albumin based on these. On the presumption that albius may actually ignore all these things, this is 
probably something Jackie might go over, but I just wanted to point something out that there was a cost-effective analysis that was done presuming um, al albumin resulted in a mortality benefit as Albius may have suggested. And the authors go through a very complicated algorithm, but essentially they rely heavily on the fact that patients receiving albumin will not be a dialysis dependent, will not have ventilator days as those receiving saline. And they justify that perhaps there is a small cost difference of about $700 per patient um, over here. But with the current data, all of these calculations don't apply. Now, most of this, like albumin is a drug. Just like any drugs, we also have to keep in mind that there are so many other side effect profiles that we have to worry about. And a lot of these randomized controlled trials don't actually weigh in on them. And they're actually not even well elucidated. So number one, albumin is a blood product. So any of the complications that we expect with blood transfusion, we should expect with albumin. Although viruses and things of that nature are screened for and are pretty much inactivated um, for the most part, there are still some concerns like parvovirus B19 or hepatitis A have been reported uh, despite of all these um, uh, precautions. And actually this is for a warning from the FDA uh, website on albumin that we should be cautious of them, including um, Creutzfeldt-Jakob's disease. And then of course, it, it triggers the immune system. Um, it can, it's always has a risk for allergic response like any blood product. Um, <clears throat> albumin has been shown to reduce um, immunoglobulin and our response to um, vaccinations as well. So, but the long-term uh, effect of this is essentially unknown. And then, um, this was a 1978 study that suggested that perhaps patients receiving albumin had um, required ventilator support of eight days as those compared with, compared with only three days for those patients not receiving albumin. Similarly, a lot of um, ex physiologic studies have shown that albumin infusion perhaps may have a bad effect on the kidneys. Um, albumin leads to um, occlusion of the collecting tubules because mm -hmm. of microaggregates, which could eventually result in a GFR impairment through uh, tubular glomerular feedback. NGAL, which is a um, very good marker for kidney injury, has been shown to be elevated in those patients who receive albumin. But then this has not been clinically translated yet to um, renal outcome. And then because of the increased oncotic pressure in the peritubular capillaries, uh, there has been shown, physiologically at least, there is impaired sodium and water handling by the kidneys because of albumin, which eventually has resulted in renal failure. And then albumin is very similar to heparin and it carries a lot of negative charge and it binds to antithrombin 3. So therefore, the amount of heparin requirement is inversely related to the albumin concentration. And this, been shown, this has been shown in pharmacokinetic studies. Um, and then also, um, hypoalbuminemia has been attributed to the hypercoagulable states, suggesting that perhaps albumin infusion also does affect homeostasis. And this has been kind of shown in, uh, this is reflected in the SOFA score analysis of the Albius trial. And in addition, albumin, we don't really know how albumin infusion actually affects drug dosing because a lot of drugs are albumin bound, including Lasix, uh, which we common use and I'm not going into the details of that because there's been a lot of uh, studies that have shown that even that uh, is not physiologically sound i.e. using albumin with Lasix. Um, and then of course albumin has been shown to cause uh, alter calcium because albumin binds divalent cations and in addition albumin has also been shown to change uh, acid-base physiology. So if we ignore all of these and we're just going to use albumin there are so many other unanswered questions as well, because none of the studies have actually standardized any of the doses, um, the concentration, or even what are we targeting. So in summary, albumin is not superior to what we have, i.e. crystalloids. It's not safe. I mean, it is safe, but there are other things that have not been well elucidated in clinical trials, and it's not cost effective. So why do we still have to implement World War II practices? With that, I end my talk. I can't help it. <laughs>
So this is them laying in our snowboard boots because we both like to snowboard. This is before they used to cry all night long. Uh, okay, so Junior kind of did a really good job talking about the basic science, and he actually gave you a lot of information about basic science and albumin's effect on the body that, I'll be honest, I would not have ever gone into because Junior's a much smarter human than I am. Um, so I'll just talk to you briefly about what albumin does so we're all on the same page and where this comes from. So like Junior mentioned, it's a negatively charged anion. Um, it's the most abundant plasma protein, largely intravascular, synthesized only in the liver, and the synthesis is largely dependent on nutritional intake. And it has a half-life of only 21 days, which is why it's one of the things we're able to watch plummet while they're in the hospital when they're critically ill. So what are the physiologic effects of albumin? And Junior kind of already summed this up, so I'm not going to go through this whole slide um, for both time's sake and for not boring you guys to death's sake. Um, but he talked about the, and it, it, I'm not sure that he mentioned the antioxidant properties. I think he did. Um, but it also, on top of everything else that he mentioned, has antioxidant properties. So what's this role of albumin in critical illness? And I think this is where, obviously, the debate comes in. The question is, is it debatable? Why, do we, why did we ever even start thinking that it had a role in critical illness? And I think a lot of this comes from the knowledge that low albumin leads to poor outcomes. And you can't argue with that. There's no argument against that. There's study and study and study and study again that being admitted critically ill with a low albumin leads to poor outcomes. The, the study that I have quoted at the bottom was in the Journal of Clinical Epidemiology in 97. Um, it showed that there was an increase in odds of deaths that ranged up to 56% for each 2.5 gram per liter decrease in albumin in critically ill patients. And this was a, another heterogeneous population, so all patients. Um, a 47% increase in each gram per liter of hemodialysis patients specifically, and it was a good all cause uh, predictor of all cause 30 day mortality. Um, this is a, a meta analysis from 2003. It was 90 cohort studies of albumin and nine randomized control trials correcting albumin. And again, just demonstrated that low albumin was associated with higher mortality, longer ICU and hospital stays, and higher cost. Um, and each, in this study, each gram per deciliter drop increased mortality risk by 137%. So it stands to, to reason that fixing low albumin must be good, right? That's where it came from. And this is the review that, that uh, Junior kind of already went into. Again, I'm not going to go into it in depth. He did a better job than I would do. Um, but concluded that there was a strong suggestion that albumin may increase mortality. Um, however, and the, this is, it's kind of a busy slide, but a sum up of all the studies that were used, you'll notice that really the number of patients column, there's one study that had 171 patients and one study that had 219, one with 107. The rest of them were all like 25, 29, 17, and the deaths were in some of them, you know, that one study there's 17 patients and 12 of them died. So disproportionate number of deaths per studies. There really wasn't a great pool of data to pull this from. So this is my picture. Of Casey's on the, on the left acting like the people who knew right the whole time, and Caitlin's on the right like, oh, man, I've been using albumin and I'm an idiot. Um, so what's the albumin? <laughs> this is the argument against albumin. Um, so, and this was an informal like pool that I took. And you talk to people, and I know in the medical ICU, we tend to be much more against albumin than in some other places. So I kind of, when I was, there's no better way to get a senior fellow's heart rate up than to ask them to present something that you know that everybody in the NICU hates. Like that is the best way to get somebody nervous. And so I was trying to figure out, talking to people, like, what, what do people not like about albumin? What are your concerns with albumin? Why don't you use albumin? And the major arguments that came up were, it's expensive, it's made from human plasma, it leaks from the capillaries, and all of these kind of fall onto the premise that it doesn't improve mortality. So is it really worth doing any of the above things to somebody if it doesn't improve mortality? And so my argument is that it does improve mortality in a certain subset of patients. And so we need to be careful when we make sweeping statements that it doesn't improve mortality at all. So this is the SAFE study, um, which Junior went through again. I'm not going to go through details, but um, they were patients in whom the treating clinician judged to require fluids to either maintain or increase intravascular volume. And for those of you who missed the way the study was performed, so they were either um, designated to the albumin arm or the non-albumin arm, and then they were replaced over the next several days with either albumin or normal saline. So it wasn't used only as a resuscitation fluid, it was also used as a maintenance colloid. Um, there was nearly, it was a large study. There was nearly 7,000 patients enrolled across 16 hospitals in Australia and New Zealand. Um, they looked at days spent in the ICU, hospital days, vented days, days on um, renal replacement therapy and mortality. And they concluded that one, albumin administration was safe, which is something I'm kind of going to harp on in all of these for the naysayers of albumin being a human product. Um, so there were no adverse events with albumin administration. And also there was no increase in mortality, which is 
sort of against what the Cochrane uh, review had said, but there was no clear benefit of the albumin administration over crystalloids. That being said, as Junior stole my thunder, there is a subgroup of patients with severe sepsis in whom there was a non-statistically significant lower risk of death. And in the hemodynamic aspect, the patients in the albumin group had lower heart rates and improved CVPs, which indicates that there was an improvement in hemodynamics or a hemo at least a hemodynamic benefit in the patients who received albumin. So I'm kind of talking really fast because we're pressed for time. If anybody has trouble, I know I like blur through things, feel free to stop me. <laughs> um, so this is just the representation. You can see on days one and three, the heart rates were better for the patients in the albumin arm, and the CVP was better in days one through three. And then the subset of patients with severe sepsis, Junior showed this as well. Patients with, in the albumin group, there was a favor towards albumin over the patients who were, over the all-cause patients. Um, there was also a small albumin favoritism in the ARDS group as well. So this was the ad hoc analysis that was published later. Um, it, was the two it was the predefined group analysis from the original SAFE study. It was 1,218 patients. Um, and again, demonstrating heart rate and CVP were better. There was no difference in renal or total SOFA scores. And they demonstrated that patients were at a lower risk of mortality, but they couldn't prove that it was significantly lower. Jeff, were better in this initial, the, first stage or the heart rate was one and three, and CVP was one through three. Yeah. Um, okay, this was a 2011, I lied, Jana, don't interrupt me. This was a 2011 <laughs> study, uh, another meta-analysis. And so that was something I wanted to say while Junior was talking. You'll notice that a lot of these are meta-analysis. There's not a lot of good, neither one of us are talking about this wonderful randomized controlled trial looking at albumin. And part of that is because albumin is relatively cheap and nobody wants to fund a study and part of that is because we have they, they just keep rehashing the same data and using them in meta-analyses and that's one of the things that when I get to ARDS and albumin you'll kind of see that more than anything uh, but this is a 2011 meta-analysis of uh, fluid resuscitation with albumin containing solutions versus others it was the first to re review to look so first meta-analysis review to look solely at this subgroup and they actually found that there was it was associated with a lower mortality um, the CRYSTAL trial, again, with Junior kind of touched on, is 2013. So it was nearly 3,000 patients, 57 ICUs internationally, and they compared crystalloids to colloids as a resuscitation fluid in critically ill patients. There was no difference in 28-day mortality, but there was a lower risk of mortality at 90 days in the colloid group. And one of the major problems with this study, and I think I pulled this that screenshot out, was that um, they didn't actually choose which type of colloid or which type of crystalloid one could use. So there is 20% albumin use, 4% albumin use, the starch was used, and then the crystalloid, the crystalloid group, there was hypertonic saline, hypotonic saline. It, the, all that they cared about was colloid versus crystalloid. So that was one of the big problems with this study. But you can see that there was a trend towards a mortality benefit at 90 days. Any questions so far? Yeah. Oh, just so, dusting. So, okay. Jack, so you're saying in that study they randomized patients to crystalloid or colloid, but they didn't tell them yes. which one to use? Yes. So I had originally had a slide, and I think I, read, I, I went through these so many different times that I pulled it out. Um, the original slide that I had had the different groups in it, and so there was, they used starch, they used 4%, they used 20% albumin, and they used gel. Um, and then in the, in the crystalloids group, there was Lactate ringers, hypertonic saline, normal saline, and hypotonic saline. I've never read the study, but you, did you get an understanding of why? <laughs> I didn't. I, I really didn't, couldn't understand. I think because they said that they wouldn't be able to fully blind it if they told them what to use, and it was too difficult to standardize across 57 different ICUs, was my understanding. It was it was a um, practical issue. Well, it was a European study. So yeah. In Europe, they look at colloids a little bit. They consider, prior to the big catastrophic issue, they considered them all as fluid. So they could not have enough data to say that yeah. having starch was any better than albumin versus thinner starch versus gel. So they got they got the substance called gel fusion, which is actually gelatin in fluids that you give the expanse of iron space. So there are passionate people throughout Europe who believe that this is even better than albumin. They actually which we've never heard of, because I had to Google I that. <laughs> Since that, do we know that it also has a lot of female effects? Female is recombinant albumin. So people don't realize you can 
form of E-coli they train to make albumin. So there's a recombinant component in Europe that's not even related to human It that doesn't come from humans, it comes from cells make albumin. So <laughs> that takes the whole factor of adverse reactions and transmission. Yes. So the Albio study, um, the other one that Junior touched on as well, so 2014, it was another large study, 1,818 patients. They used 20% albumin versus crystalloid, and their goal was to maintain the serum albumin at 30 goals per liter. Um, they looked at any cause death at 28 days, secondary outcomes were 90 days, organ dysfunction and degree, ICU and hospital length of stays. Again, they found no significant difference between the two groups, um, but evidence of improved hemodynamics, again, in the albumin group. So their cardiovascular scores were better, um, and they actually had time to suspension of vasopressor inotropic agents that was significantly less. Um, this was the probability of survival, so you can see a trend towards improvement in albumin versus crystalloids. And this was what they published from their post hoc analysis of the subgroup of patients with septic shock with a statistically significant improvement in survival for albumin versus crystalloids. So the question of does this, does albumin provide a mortality benefit, I think you have to ask yourself in which subset of patients. I think that what they have maybe not definitively proven, but definitely given pause for thought, is that patients with septic shock may be patients in whom albumin is appropriate. <clears throat> Some of the other times where albumin's been, been at least been able to prove that it's of use, um, is in two other types of patients, and those are ARDS patients and um, patients with spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. So this study is really the only one of its kind that I could find. It was albumin and Lasix in hypoproteinemic patients with acute lung injury. injury. It was published in 2002. Another small study, so I'm, I know I'm bashing small studies in one review, and now I'm showing you a small study in another. But it was done at Vanderbilt Hosp Hospital. Um, they compared Lasix alone plus Lasix versus Lasix plus albumin and looked at change in weight, hemodynamics, respiratory system compliance, and oxygenation. And they concluded that, again, albumin is safe um, and it improved oxygenation immediately, but it didn't affect overall mortality. And actually, all the patients plateaued by the end. So here's the change in PaO2, FiO2 ratio. You see the albumin group is the dotted line. They sort of peak up very quickly when they receive the albumin and then they start to level out towards the end. Um, they also had improvement in their uh, math versus heart rate, and they had improvement in the days requiring mechanical ventilation. But again, those aren't really statistically significant, and they continue to intersect throughout. Um, this was so the, these are the two meta analyses I was touching on earlier. There's in two, at least two major meta analyses that I could find after that study looking at albumin and ARDS. The only studies that these really base their meta-analysis on are studies done by uh, Greg Martin, who is the guy who published this study. So this was a meta-analysis published in 2005, I think, which aimed to evaluate collars versus crystalloids in adults with ARDS, and they only looked at three studies. The SAFE study, and then two studies looking at Lasix plus albumin, the one I showed you, and one other that was done by the same guy. Um, with their effect on oxygenation. So they essentially summed it up to say the same thing that he said. Albumin improves oxygenation during early treatment but had no effect on mortality. This is the schematic of that. Um, and this study, which was done in 2014, I don't know why we keep revisiting the same subject with no studies to an analyze, but they did it again and they looked at two eligible studies, which you can imagine were the two studies that are in this schematic here. <laughs> Um, and then finally, in SVP, this is a, a quality randomized control trial done in a, it was it was published in 1999. Compared patients with spontaneous bacterial peritonitis who received antibiotics alone to patients who received antibiotics plus albumin, and found that administration of albumin prevented renal impairment and improved mortality. And that was pretty definitively, without a doubt, shown in this study, which is why we still use that today. So my argument for albumin in these populations is. For the ARDS patients, um, it, we have you, to guess which daughter this is. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is the one with the mangioma. So she makes it easy because she's she's got her little mangioma, but and she makes the funnier faces. This is Jana's favorite baby, if anybody wants to know, because she opened her eyes and looked at her in L and D four. Um, so it depends on you know what your goals are, and this is something I think from the beginning of my trainer training, I remember Dr. Rivers always saying to me when we talked about different things was, what are you trying to do? And what's your goal? 
And so if your goal for ARDS and albumin is to improve oxygenation immediately, then there's an argument that it's helpful. If your goal is to get them off the vent quicker, quicker, well, we may not have any evidence that that's actually helpful yet. If your goal is to improve hemodynamics and septic shock to decrease your vasopressor use, then we probably have studies that support its use. If your goal is to improve mortality, that's still debatable. So I think anytime you're looking at something, what is your goal? What are you trying to do with the drug that you're about to use? And I think we have evidence for it in certain situations if you understand what you're looking to do. Um, so the other arguments against albumin are the adverse reactions. And this is something that Junior presented as well. Um, so I'm not going to reread that, but cruiser Jakob disease, Hep A. Um, the major adverse reactions are fever, nausea, vomiting, urticaria, hypertension, increased elevation, so more along the, the allergy side. Um, but no large center trials have been able to demonstrate risk. And what I mean by that is all the studies I just showed you, one of the first things in every single one of those studies is, quote unquote, albumin is safe. So nobody had an adverse reaction to albumin that they reported. This is the um, FDA's essential classification of what the reactions are, and they're all either rare or very rare. And this is the only, the only study that I could find of patients' adverse reactions to albumin. There was a compilation of serious adverse event reporting from 90 to 97. There was millions of doses of albumin that were produced in those years, and there was only 123 adverse events. And this is the graphical representation of which ones were fatal, which ones were non-fatal. Of those 103, there were five total events that were considered, quote unquote, possibly related to albumin, and how those patients ultimately died was, uh, or <coughs> how the reported causes were, was bradycardia, excessive hypotonia, leukemia, pancreatic cancer, and allergic shock. So what the authors essentially concluded was, in the period in which there was approximately 100 million albumin doses distributed worldwide, serious adverse events were very rare. Um, that's, a, that's the babies with the dog. <laughs> My dog's not really that big, the babies were just that small. Um, so the argument against albumin being expensive, is albumin more expensive than saline? Yes, and I think Junior did a really good job of summing that. But what I would challenge Junior to do is calculate for his $1 per, how much was it? $1 per gram. per gram of saline you use compared to how much albumin you use to see what the cost ended up being at the end of the day. Because in all the studies where they used albumin with saline, the patients who received albumin received considerably less saline than the patients who received albumin plus saline. So if you calculated those costs together, plus the study that Junior touched on um, with the, the total cost per life year, does it end up being cheaper? Again, I'm not really sure we have strong evidence for that. And this study was so number heavy, I think you need an engineering degree to understand how they came to the conclusion. So I really like stared at it a million times and then decided I didn't, couldn't understand exactly how they came to the conclusion, except that they were relying on the fact that albumin improves mortality. But they, they essentially concluded that albumin was cheaper. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, because albumin is not that expensive, nobody wants to support a, a large randomized control trial because it just doesn't have an attractive price tag on it. There's a baby sleeping. All right, so my conclusions. Um, is it safe? Yes, it's very safe. There's been very few reports of serious adverse events. No safety issues in large multi-center trials um, and no real huge case reports of major adverse events. Is it expensive? Yeah, it's a little more expensive than saline, but it leads to earlier cessation of vasopressors, which are not cheap in and of themselves when you include the nursing care required, the physician care required, and all that to maintain the vasopressors, and it leads to less administration of saline. Does it have hemodynamic effects? So this goes back to what is your goal? Yes, I think we know it has hemodynamic effects. In the SAFE trial, we saw the lowered heart rate and increased CVP. In the Alveo study, we had increased MAP and CVP and decreased pressor requirements. So I think there's a, there's a good base to understand that there were some hemodynamic effects. Is there a mortality benefit? You know, this is where really the debate gets heated. Um, and so some, the SAFE study said there, should, there seemed to be a trend towards it in the 28-day mortality. Albio su supported a 90-day mortality. Um, but again, the, I, I understand this is where we get a lot more heated about it. But there's no change in ICU length of stay, ventilator days, or renal replacement therapy requirements. So who do I think should get albumin, and who do, who do I support receiving albumin after doing all of this research? Patients who are in septic shock re requiring large volume replacement. 
Um, patients with ARDS requiring diuresis, we want to improve the oxygenation. And patients with SBP with peritonitis and shock. And this, just to throw it in there, is the surviving sepsis campaign guidelines where they actually recommend the use of albumin or consider the use of albumin in severe sepsis and septic shock with patients who require substantial amounts of crystalline. It's a grade 2C recommendation, so take that with a grain of salt, but it is recommended. Um, who should not get it? Patients with low initial albumin. So less than 1.5 milligrams per deciliter. We know a lot, most of the studies show that patients with less than 1.5 milligram per deciliter albumin, increase, the mortality approach is 100%. So you're not going to benefit from replacing with albumin. And actually giving them albumin is just going to skew any of the studies that you have because their mortality walking in is so high that their death isn't really going to affect us. <laughs> this is not probably the right way to wear that. And that is it. Any questions? So I have a question. I know you do. Because <laughs> you mentioned uh, multiple times that albumin is 